a member of the Board of Trustees. This video presentation will attempt to describe the evolution of the foundation uh, from a new slant using old newspaper articles, magazine articles, a few uh, slides, and some videos from 1989, 90, and mostly from uh, 1991. This will be an honest attempt to briefly try to, to tell the story as it unfolded and as it is presently going forth today. Uh, my explanations will be unrehearsed and spontaneous, so please bear with me as I attempt to tell this story. It will be far from complete because I am limited in the presentation or the production of this program with materials that are available to me um, on this fall 1991 trip to the United States. But before I get into these materials, I think I should maybe uh, begin by answering one question which is very, very frequently asked me, and that is, why is it that I went to Guatemala and have now spent almost 25 years uh, in uh, doing this work with Indians? Uh, and I have to really uh, say that it started when I was 16 years old, when I uh, had a near-death experience, an NDE as they call them today. Uh, this actually transformed my life. It, uh, it made me feel that I had a purpose, that I had some important work to do in helping needy peoples. Over the next 14 years, um, a whole series of experiences of a spir very spiritual nature prompted me to do as I heard it. Uh, Ezra Taft Benson once say in a BYU devotional that he would do if he had it, uh, his life to live over again. That was, go south, young man. And so that's exactly what I did. I headed south. So we sold everything we had, uh, packed equipment that we felt would be necessary, and we headed south from Provo, Utah. Uh, our trail, of course, led us towards Mexico. And here uh, I will show you a map uh, indicating uh, just exactly where this little country half the size of Utah called Guatemala is found. It is surprising uh, how many people uh, uh, we talk to don't uh, know for sure where Guatemala is. In fact, I didn't know myself for sure where it was when I received a, a mission call to Central America uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, but Guatemala is uh, on uh, Mexico's southern border. We always travel down through Texas and go out of the country at McAllen or at Re enter at Reynosa, travel down the east coast uh, through Veracruz and then across the isthmus of Tuanapec to Tapachula. And there we're on the Guatemalan border. It's just 1,200 miles from uh, McAllen, Texas. And so there we are in the little country of Guatemala, half the size of Utah but a country that is so fascinating uh, with such a wide uh, variation of geography and climates. In fact, it is said that there is not a plant known to man that will not grow somewhere in Guatemala. And so we have your high mountains, and many of the Indians live in the central highlands uh, where uh, there is frost uh, for a number of months every year and they can grow apples and then of course there are the tropical uh, jungles, uh, rainforests, uh, there's also a desert area with cactus and then there's the area of the country where uh, we live, the Koban area where it is green all year round with uh, fairly constant uh, rainfall. But of course the main thing of interest to uh, people that go to Guatemala is the Indian culture that has even a, a wider range of color and variation than does the uh, climate and the geography. And we went with the vision of establishing a partnership with a group of Indians or groups of Indians and uh, with them uh, develop a strategy to help them overcome uh, their life and death problems which are, are very acute to say the least. And so uh, we of course believed that they uh, have the potential of achieving the greatness which their ancestors once had, uh, the Mayans, uh, uh, for example, are, are these people and uh, they're descendants of them and uh, a people which uh, many people today call the, the Greeks of the New World. Uh, they were so advanced and so progressive, uh, being the only group of 
uh, American Indians that had a written language with their histories, uh, their sacred records. Uh, and so we believe that uh, they would once again be able to achieve uh, that kind of greatness. Uh, but we had to work out a strategy to make it possible. And so uh, it was to work among these people that, that we went uh, with the uh, very, very strong feeling that we would be able to uh, do some good, organize anything. Uh, we just wanted to go as a family and get a business started, employ as many Indians as we could, and and hope that uh, from our profits we could we could help the people a great deal. But we began getting uh, quite a bit of publicity, uh, quite unsolicited, and uh, and so here are a couple of the files that, uh, that hold some of this information. Maybe we could just look at a couple of. Uh, a few pieces uh, in those beginning years uh, to give you an idea as to uh, what uh, what we were doing and, and what some people thought about it. Uh, probably the first piece of publicity we received was a uh, brief article in the Daily Universe at Brigham Young University entitled A Missionary's Dream and it talks about some of our first activities. Uh, we had a traveling movie uh, which we mentioned just a moment. And then in October of 1967, uh, the Oak Hill Second Ward, uh, which I had previously been a member of, and where my parents attended church, uh, they published a, a, an article in their uh, newsletter entitled A True Love Story. And so this uh, talks about uh, the whole thing that we were trying to do uh, in going to, uh, to Guatemala to work among the Indians. Then some pieces uh, came out in the church news, uh, uh, including uh, the uh, the picture on the on the front page of the church news, which was a picture I had taken of Kunin in the Department of Quiche. And there's an article here which enti is entitled "Guatemala Calls." Inside, there's a photograph of uh, me unloading uh, a portable movie screen in front of a Catholic chapel that we used as a movie theater in a, a traveling movie enterprise that we had, which is kind of like a private Peace Corps, uh, where we would travel from city to city or town to town, including towns that had never seen a movie, towns that didn't have any electricity. So we were uh, in the very back roads in the country, uh, showing educational and commercial type movies to the people. The article is entitled, Sell That Thou Hast, Come and Follow Me. And so there's that article that uh, came out in the church news and, uh, and we started receiving letters uh, and a lot of interest was generated in what we were doing. That was in 1968. Then an article came out, I believe, in the Daily Herald entitled Ex Provo and Working with Indians on a ranch he bought in Guatemala. And there, uh, there's a picture of me directing uh, a song in a uh, mutual uh, meeting and I uh, and then another picture of me and my helper, Carlos, who presently is the manager of our business in Guatemala, but he is a young 12, 13-year-old boy, was my partner in going around and visiting and treating sick people. That previous article perhaps was in the uh, Desert News, uh, but uh, here's one in the Daily Herald that came out about that time, entitled, Provolone is Making Dream a Reality, uh, with a picture of me as good-looking young guy. Uh, this was, uh, it looks like it's in June 30th of 1969. In the same year, 1969, a uh, rather large article came out in the church news, uh, which was a full spread in the middle. And this article in the church news was entitled, Indian's Friend Returns, and has uh, a lot of pictures. Uh, of uh, us working with uh, all the young people in vegetable gardening projects uh, and then other uh, projects and activities. By this time we'd started our own school and of course we were uh, raising cattle and, and uh, had uh, raising chickens and doing a lot of things. Um, and we had also built a lake and so we, there was a little boating and fishing going on. And, and so, uh, but all of this was just done as a family, uh, with some help, of course, from my father, who was a very key figure in this whole thing. 
By this time, we had acquired a large family. Uh, it was no plan of ours, but uh, we had no choice but to take in Indian orphan children and others that were in great need. And another article came out uh, talking about this and explaining that we uh, that there was actually a group that was forming, a group of interested people that wanted to help us. So in early 1970, uh, a foundation was organized. Uh, I didn't knew nothing about it, had nothing to do with its organization, but it was organized by my father uh, and, a, and a number of friends um, and acquaintances in Provo and in the Utah area. Uh, it was called the Cordell Anderson Foundation at that time. Later, of course, that was changed at my request uh, to the Foundation for Indian Development. And this is the uh, first piece of literature uh, produced by the Foundation. See here, uh, talking about what we were attempting to do down there, and asking those who were interested uh, to help. So there's a fairly good explanation of what we were trying to do, and pictures of some of which we have seen already, and that come out in, in newspapers. And then uh, there uh, was produced the first annual report of the foundation. Uh, uh, let's see what the date might be on this. It, well, it, was, it has a financial report for 1970, uh, and so it would have been produced in 1971. Uh, and so you can see there a little bit just what the finances were. Uh, contributions of $6,900, and expenditures, uh, expending everything, and we had nothing left over at the end of the year. Interest uh, increased uh, at the uh, BYU uh, 96th Annual Commencement uh, uh, on the campus when uh, President uh, Ernest L. Wilkinson spoke about me as a uh, BYU graduate that uh, is an example for others. His speech was a very lengthy one and our mention was just a paragraph, but, but this helped us get the additional publicity and paved the way for uh, an article that came out in a special issue of the New Enzyme magazine uh, previously, it, of course, was the Improvement Era, uh, but uh, it, was an art, it was an issue dedicated to the Lamanites, and the article chosen uh, to represent Latin America was an article written about our work, even though, of course, it was not uh, the church work. It wasn't uh, officially connected with, uh, with any church. It was just a, a group of interested people, but they, we were, of course, all LDS. And so this special issue of the Ensign uh, came out in, uh, let's see if we can see the date there, it's July of 1971. The article was uh, entitled Awakening Guatemala. And uh, the letters poured in from all over, uh, people wanting to help in a lot of different ways, including a number of people who wanted to sell out whatever they had and pack up and come and join us. In fact, some tried to do that um, without proper preparation. Uh, uh, none of them lasted for very long. Later that year, the same article came out in the Spanish language publication, La Jona, and uh, publicity uh, increased. Uh, articles uh, were published in the uh, Brigham Young University today. Uh, we had uh, advertisements, actually, uh, such as this one here in the BYU Today magazine, or newspaper at that time. And by this time, of course, we changed the name, and it was called the Foundation for Indian Development. And we could go on and on and on talking about this and, and showing all the pieces of uh, literature, uh, uh, newsletters that we published, and articles that uh, came out in newspapers. Uh, some interesting ones, for example, was in the Sunstone uh, magazine, which back in those days was a uh, small format. And so there's uh, an article in here about uh, us entitled The Guatemalan Project. The title actually is Alone in a Valley, uh, Cordell Anderson's Private Peace Corps, and written by Elizabeth Shaw. And here there are a lot of pictures, a picture of the, the valley itself and of the family at that time, of me visiting uh, Indians in their homes and treating them. Uh, homes that we were building for the Indians, our Indian employees. A picture here of the old central house. Uh, of course, this was uh, here some of the Indian boys that we'd brought in. Uh, uh, 
we actually came to have about 50 living in this house, which of course was renovated somewhat. It, uh, it ceased being this uh, ghost house that you see there. Uh, but so there's this article in, in Sunstone. And then there was uh, other additional publicity we received uh, in the alumni banquet when I was uh, given, in 1977, when I was given the uh, uh, Alumni Distinguished Service Award, uh, along with uh, other people such as uh, Neil Maxwell and uh, Marty Bean. And so I was in company of pretty fast people at that time. And, uh, in fact, it was said that I was probably the youngest that had ever received the award, uh, the least educated, and uh, probably the uh, uh, most unlikely to ever repeat. <laughs> and so there's just a lot of things. But the thing is, we received a lot of publicity, and so the foundation was off and running. Uh, and so uh, this was something that we had not planned for. Uh, our publication came to be known as A Voice from the Dust and eventually just The Voice. Um, and so our work has gone forward on, on that basis. So here we are among Guatemala's Indians. Uh, we're going to see a few uh, views of uh, the Indian culture around the country. Um, to show you a little bit about the people that we went to work with and that I've continued to work with for uh, almost 25 years now. These people here happen to be uh, from a village of Chipwak, above Totonicopan, where we help them with their potable water system. But um, when we went to Guatemala, we of course had to uh, had to. Uh, get a business going, we had to be able to support ourselves, and uh, so we had to follow the Indians' example of being hard workers, and you can see in these views here that they really are hard workers, doing all of the, uh, the work in these fields by hand, um, very beautiful work, uh, so they're very hard working people to say the very least. Uh, well, we got started uh, in, uh, in this work by uh, getting a business going that, uh, we, well, we were in the chicken business, we had a little property. Uh, of course, that was after the traveling movie uh, that was mentioned previously had uh, somewhat failed. And uh, it, it wasn't uh, the kind of a thing that could support us. So we eventually bought a small piece of property uh, and got a chicken farm going. It happened to be the first chicken uh, commercial chicken uh, farm in northern Guatemala and uh, from there we eventually had the opportunity of, of uh, purchasing uh, on very <laughs> miraculous terms uh, the Paradise Valley Plantation or the Finca Valparaiso. Uh, here you're seeing other uh, traditional uh, scenes from Indian Guatemala, uh, their traditional dan dances, uh, the marimba, we've seen the chiramilla and the tambor that we see again here in the uh, in the folklore festival in Santa Cruz de la Paz uh, just this year. Uh, so we're dealing here with a very colorful uh, people, very colorful cu culture, and we live in this municipality of Santa Cruz de la Paz uh, where this folklore festival was held. And it's there that we have uh, the Paradise Valley Plantation uh, that eventually became known as the Center for Indian Development. Uh, and it's from, from that base of operations that we have fanned out uh, with projects scattered around the country, but of course that was after the foundation came to exist. Here uh, you see one of the candidates uh, in her typical clothing, and you see that uh, they have a lot of jewelry. Uh, uh, there's been a carryover from uh, ancient days when uh, they were warned not to uh, uh, be involved in uh, costly apparel. Uh, and that's one of the problems. Uh, I'm not saying that we should do away with the Indian clothing, but there does have to be some uh, modification. Here we can see the queen being uh, not crowned because they decided not to use the crown anymore because that was something from the Spaniards. And so they were putting a very special traditional uh, type of cloth in, braided in her hair. Uh, rather than crowning her. Um, and so th they are beginning to get the sense uh, that things 
uh, that the Spaniards brought are things that they don't necessarily want anymore, that it hasn't uh, necessarily been uh, a blessing in their lives. Uh, so they've began this. Uh, of course, there's even a movement among Indian leaders to not celebrate Columbus Day and the arrival uh, of Columbus, the discovery of America. Uh, they feel this uh, was a curse. Of course, they have aspects of their own culture that we are seeing here, which is a trapiche, or one of their native uh, uh, sugarcane crushers that they use to get the juice out of sugarcane to make their own liquor, uh, with which they very uh, inexpensively can get drunk, and they do it very frequently, and that's another of the problems of the Indian culture. Uh, the Ladinos in Guatemala, the non-Indians, like this. Uh, they voted this the, the best uh, presentation, uh, but it, it's with a negative connotation. And here you see Catholicism, of course, is very deeply ingrained in the uh, Indian culture today, and that's also something that was not uh, traditionally a part of their culture and has not helped them come out of darkness. And so the Indians today really do live in a type of darkness. Uh, their sacred book, uh, the Popol Vuh, uh, talks about uh, anciently a darkness coming upon them. And they're living in that. Uh, that darkness has brought many problems, uh, poverty and ignorance and uh, alcoholism and uh, uh, isolation, um, a lack of opportunity, uh, discrimination, uh, malnutrition, uh, a lot of sickness, uh, unbelievable infant mortality that has about 50,000 Indian children dying every year and so there's some real problems uh, in Indian Guatemala and of course it was to solve these problems that we uh, went to Guatemala and eventually the uh, Finca Valparaíso became known as the CID or the Center for Indian Development number one uh, which we are entering